Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the three to six player game, Voices in My Head, designed by Corey Kineska and published by Unexpected Games, who helped sponsor this video. Well, you went and robbed a bank. Probably shouldn't have done that, but that's in the past. Now you're in court, you're on trial, and the prosecutor isn't gonna take it easy on you. Should you tell the truth? Lie about it? Beg for mercy? You've got a lot of competing emotions, and they're all gonna be pulling you in different directions. So compose yourself, join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. To set up, put the game board in the center of the play area, and this shows a picture of Guy Johnson's head. Guy is the guy on trial for robbery, and each of these icons represents a region that makes up an aspect of his personality. His motor skills, instincts, his speech, observation, and planning. Now find these five region platforms and attach a plastic railing to the top of each of them. Then set the platforms into the holes of the board like this, and each of these have a ledge on the back of them so that they can hold up this mine board, securing it in place once all of them have been installed. By the board, put these double-sided innocent and guilty tokens, then find these influence tokens, ensuring that they're thoroughly mixed face down with this side face up. Now find the roll cards, which will have this back. And some of these will show values in their bottom right-hand corners. And you'll wanna find the ones showing your number of players. In this video, we'll assume we have four players and then return all the other rolls back to the box. Now shuffle the rolls and deal one of them to each of the players. You can look at your own, but keep it a secret from the other players, unless you're dealt the prosecutor, in which case you'll set that face up on the table in front of you and you'll collect this prosecutor screen as well. The prosecutor now finds the cards that make up the stage one trial deck, which will show a number one here at the top. They shuffle this deck and then set it with this side face up behind their screen, dealing two cards from the top of it and placing them to the right. There's also a stage two deck, but set that off to the side for now. They also set these eight dark gray tokens beside their board where everyone can see them with the numbered sides face up. And beside that, they can keep this token showing a cartoon version of the prosecutor. So that's the prosecutor taken care of. All the other players will be known as personas or quite literally, the voices in Guy's head, which will influence how he acts throughout the trial. Each of these players will now pick a color and gather the related reference sheet, stick, and eight control markers with their number side face up where everyone can see them. Now shuffle the strategy cards, which have this back, and set them beside the board as a deck, dealing two of them to each persona player. The prosecutor player never gets any of these cards, and while the personas can examine their own, they must keep them a secret from the other players. The prosecutor now takes these story cards, which say start of trial on their faces, and gives them a good mix, picking one randomly and putting the rest back in the box. They now read this side of the card out loud. At the top, you'll find some story text, but as you continue, you'll find some instructions, and you follow these. For example, this says to put one guilty token on the judgmental jurors and one innocent token on the laid back jurors. You'll find the jurors at the very top of the board with spaces above their heads and the pairs of jurors each have different labels. Logical, judgmental, distracted, laid back, impulsive, and perceptive. These tokens will show the guilty symbol on one of their sides and we add that to the matching space above the judgmental jurors. On the other side, these show the innocent symbol, and according to the start of trial card, we add one of these to the laid back jurors. It now says to put one influence token on each of those jurors. From this pile, we set one onto the central space above those particular jurors. And you don't flip these over, their undersides should stay a secret. Finally, we're told who will get this first player token, in this case, the player who most recently had a birthday. The trial card has information on the backside as well, but we ignore that for now, setting this card beside the prosecutor. And that's the setup. In Voices in My Head, players will each be trying to gain control of the regions of Guy's brain. The personas will be doing this from within Guy's own mind, while the prosecutor will be putting the pressure on him during the court proceedings. At the end of the game, the jurors at the top of the board here will either set Guy free or send him to jail, but no matter what happens, if the outcome helps you achieve your private goal, you win. And it's possible that more than one player will achieve their goal, creating more than one winner. Here's the prosecutor's goal. 
This symbol represents the jury, and we also see the symbols for being guilty or innocent. So this objective means if there are more jury members who think Guy is guilty than think he's innocent, the prosecutor will win. On the other hand, the selfishness persona's roll card says they only win if an equal or more number of the jury members think Guy is innocent compared to how many think he's guilty. We won't go over all the different role objectives, but by the end of this video, you'll understand how to interpret them. The game is played over eight rounds, and each round has five steps, starting with choosing a trial card. Here, the prosecutor will examine and pick one of the three trial cards face up behind their screen, which includes the one on top of the deck. I'm going to pick this one. And if you pick a card other than the center one, then you swap the chosen card with it like this. You then slide the chosen card through the middle of the screen so that only its icons at the top can be seen. There's information on the underside of the trial cards, but that can't be examined by any player yet, including the prosecutor. Okay, now it's time for step two of the round, deploying control markers. Each player will have eight of these, and for the personas, they show a variety of numbers with higher ones being better. Starting with the first player, they'll take one of their unused markers and place it number side up on the brain platform near one of the regions of their choice. Then they slowly push that marker onto that region's plastic platform using what is known as their deployment stick. But there are a few rules to how you're meant to do this. First, the stick must be kept perfectly upright the whole time. It can't be pushing while slanted like this. You can pick the angle that it contacts the token, pivoting around it to start, but once you start pushing, you must follow through in a slow, straight line, staying in contact with your marker the whole time. Now, if you accidentally lose contact, regain contact gently and continue pushing. The idea here is you can't be tapping or flicking the token. Now, once your stick makes contact with the plastic railing, rotate it as necessary until it's flush with the railing. And that's it. After the first player goes, the next player in clockwise order will do the same thing, pushing any one of their tokens onto a platform of their choosing, and they can choose one that another player has gone onto already. I should point out the prosecutor's tokens are a little different. They always have a value of zero, so it really doesn't matter which of their tokens that they use. You'll notice that in addition to a number, the tokens might have other symbols, but these are only used in an advanced mode of play that we'll discuss later, so you can ignore them for now. Now you might be thinking, how do I know which platform I'll want to add a token to, or which value of token to use? Don't worry, that will make more sense very soon. But it's always a safe bet to consider the icons peeking out from the top of the prosecutor's chosen trial card. They'll give you a clue as to which region of Guy's brain is most likely to be affected during this round. So adding your markers to those areas can help you control what happens later, as we'll see. The current trial card shows the icons for instinct and motor skills. At each region of the board, you'll also find hints at what benefit you might gain from being on the related platforms, so keep these in mind too. But there's something else we need to consider, and some of you might have already been wondering about this. What happens if a token gets pushed off of a platform? If several players already had tokens on this platform, and then this yellow player adds theirs, a chain reaction is caused, knocking the blue player off. Any tokens that fall off a platform are destroyed. The player of that color should collect it and set it face down in front of themselves. A destroyed marker cannot be used for the rest of the game unless an effect says otherwise. I should mention, a marker is only destroyed if it's pushed off by another marker. In other words, if someone accidentally bumps the table and knocks one off, just set the token back where it was as best you can. Now, once everyone has had a turn, adding a control marker to the board, we move to the Resolve Trial Card step of the turn. Now, you'll leave the trial card where it is, but the prosecutor now reads it out loud. For the sake of this video, I'm going to display the card so you can read along. At the top, there's story text explaining what's happening during the trial, and then you keep reading from top to bottom. Anytime you come to a bold header, this tells you which player must resolve the text that follows it. In this case, the prosecutor is told to draw three influence tokens. They take them from this pile and examine them privately, picking one of them to assign to the distracted jurors, as it says here. These tokens go into the central spaces, and note there is no limit to the number of tokens that can be stacked into any of these spaces. 
It now tells us to discard the unchosen tokens, and these are set face down in the area for them here. You're not allowed to take notes or show tokens that you've looked at, but you can say anything you like about them, and it doesn't have to be the truth. You could claim you've added a certain type of token to a space when you really haven't. And we'll learn more about the various tokens and their purpose a little bit later. We now come to a new bolded heading that says Instinct. This is one of the names for a region on the board, and the player who controls that region now gets to resolve the effect listed here. A region is controlled by the player who has the highest total value in control markers on that platform. In the case of a tie, the first player picks which one of the tied players will get to resolve the related effect. If the first player will have to break a tie, they should do this before the related ability is read out loud by the prosecutor. So if we had a tie for control of the instinct region, the first player would break it first, and then the prosecutor would read this effect, which the winning player would resolve. If a region that would resolve has no tokens on its platform, it's considered a tie, and the first player will pick any one of the personas to resolve the related ability, but they can't choose the prosecutor. The prosecutor's tokens all have a value of zero, so they can never control a region. Instead, they just use their tokens to push other tokens around on the platform. So now we understand why we're adding tokens to platforms. It's so that the player with the highest total value there can resolve any effects related to that region. In this case, we're told that they may destroy one control marker at the motor skills region. We know that markers are destroyed when pushed off a platform, but this effect allows you to destroy a token that hasn't fallen off. Just pick any one of them and return it face down to its owner, ensuring not to disturb the other tokens on the platform. With the front of the trial card finished, it's now flipped over and the other side is resolved in the same way. And remember, this card is kept behind the prosecutor's screen as they read through all of these effects out loud. Now, if you ever see two options presented, option A and option B, after those are read, stop reading. And then the persona controlling the related region, in this case, motor skills, will have to make a choice between those options. After they make that choice, they are then read the related result found in the black box at the bottom. And then they get to resolve it. For example, if they picked B, it says they place a guilty token on the perceptive jurors. As a reminder, that means we flip one of these tokens to the guilty side and set it into the related space above those jurors. And again, there's no limit to how many tokens can be in the spaces above the jurors, so stack them up as you get more added. And if you ever run out of these innocent or guilty tokens, just use a suitable replacement like a coin. If you ever run out of influence tokens, take all of the discarded ones from here and shuffle them face down into a new draw pile beside the board. Once the front and back of the trial card has been resolved, it's moved to the side of the prosecutor's screen, and now we go to the draw card step of the round. Here, the prosecutor moves the top card of the trial deck into the middle space, so there are three trial cards revealed once again. Now we check to see who, if anyone, has control of the planning region. This is a unique area of the board because no trial cards will give special abilities for controlling this area. Instead, during this step, the player that does control it, green in this case, draws a strategy card. If there's ever no personas here, it's considered a tie between all personas and the first player will decide how the tie is broken. If you have five or six players, that player must choose one other persona to also draw a strategy card. But remember, as we said during the setup, the prosecutor never gains these. There are a variety of different strategy cards, and here's just a few of them. And these have a range of abilities that can be used anytime their listed condition applies. For example, this strategy says it can be played after you deploy a control marker to any region. You then get to destroy any marker with any portion of its token hanging off the edge of that region. If you want to play a strategy card, you must always play it as soon as the required event has happened. And in the rare event, that two players want to resolve a strategy card at the same time, the person with the first player marker decides who goes first. A single player cannot play more than one copy of the same strategy at the same time, but they can play two different ones at once, resolving one fully and then the other. If two different players want to play the same card at the same time, that's allowed, and again, the first player would decide which one resolves first. After resolving a strategy card, discard it beside its draw pile. And note, you can never have more than three strategy cards in your hand at a time. 
If you ever have more, just immediately discard back down to three. All right, with the draw card step done, we now resolve the final step, passing the first player token to the left. And this means even the prosecutor can be the first player. And those are all the steps of a round, which you'll also find on your player reference. Now it's time to start a new round, and you'll play four rounds in total like this before it's time to move on to stage two of the trial. The first four rounds represent the prosecutor presenting evidence and calling witnesses. When stage two starts, you'll now see what happens when Guy takes to the witness stand. To start stage two, first remove all of the trial cards from behind the prosecutor's screen and return them to the box. Then find the stage two trial cards we'd set aside earlier, give them a good shuffle, and then set them up behind the screen, dealing two cards to the right, just as we'd done before. You then start the fifth round, and it's very easy to tell which round you're on, because remember, you add a control marker to the board during each round. So the number of them that you have left is how many rounds you have remaining in the game. When you finish resolving the trial card in the eighth round, you can skip steps four and five, and go right to the end of the trial. To do this, the prosecutor flips the story card to the end of trial side, reads the story text aloud, and then the players resolve the bottom steps. First, each player reveals their roll card so all the players can see them. Now it's time for the jury to come to a decision. First, flip all of these influence tokens on the jurors face up one at a time. If you see this guilty symbol, put it on the guilty stack. If you see an innocent symbol, add it to the innocent stack, and if you see this, just discard it. Once those tokens are revealed, you now remove each pair of innocent and guilty tokens in their stacks until there are no pairs left. The side which still has tokens remaining in it is the conclusion that those jury members have come to. So if it looks like this, these jury members think that Guy is guilty. Well, if we resolve these jury members here, they're left with an innocent token remaining, so they think he's innocent. If after revealing the tokens and removing all pairs, there are no tokens remaining, these are undecided jury members. With all the jury members resolved, the players now check to see if they fulfilled the conditions on their roll cards. For example, for this player to win, two conditions must be true. Three or more jury members must think Guy is guilty, and this player must also currently control or tie for control of either the speech or motor skills region. Any players who fulfilled their conditions are winners, so you could have several winners, and any players who didn't have lost. In terms of the story of the trial itself, if the prosecutor wins, Guy is sent to prison, but otherwise, he's set free. If you have just three players in your game, there are some adjustments they recommend that you can read about in this column here of the rulebook to make the game more fun and balanced. Also, when you're ready, there are advanced setup rules that you can follow here that allow you to bring in a greater variety of roles and victory conditions. When you're feeling confident with the base rules, you can also introduce control marker abilities. Now, when deploying a marker to the board, if it shows a symbol beside its number, you get to trigger the related effect. For example, this symbol is the anger effect, and it lets you destroy one marker in its region from a player who hasn't taken a turn yet this round. You'll find the full rules for these special abilities in the rulebook, but you'll also find a summary of them here on the back of each player reference. But all of these special abilities, I'll leave for you to discover on your own. But otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Voices in My Head. If you have any questions at all about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the game's page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.